morning, HFM family. Good to have you here this uh, fine, wonderful uh, Sunday morning. If you would please take the welcome sheet inside of your service folder, if you receive one of those, um, complete that. And in front of you, there's a, in the empty pew, is a basket. You can either put that uh, welcome sheet there, or you can put them in the, the uh, wooden boxes as you exit either of the double doors as you uh, exit. If you want to um, if you're watching online and would like to fill out a, a welcome form online, you can go to hillsdalefmc.net, click on connect, and fill out the online connection form there, and we'll receive those uh, prayer requests and information that you might want to communicate to the office so that we can keep up to speed about uh, what's going on in your lives. Um, today at the Porta Rosa, which is Jean and I's home, uh, 312 River Street, we're offering a barbecue. We've done this for about 10 years or more or whatever. We'll provide uh, the meat and the drinks and uh, if you could bring something, of a, a, a plate to pass or a, a dish to pass and bring your own uh, chair, that would be advisable. Something that you're comfortable with. Uh, we're gonna open our home from five to seven or five until you leave. And uh, <laughs> some of you have enjoyed the, uh, the evening lights on my fountain after it's dark and that's great. So. Uh, we just have a time just to get together and, and catch up with one another. You come here and worship, and we are a pew apart from each other because of regulations that we have to follow in order to be able to do this. And it's just good to get together and be able to uh, enjoy each other's company in a relaxed uh, setting and uh, something less formal than, than Sunday morning. So you're all welcome to come tonight, uh, 312 River Street, 5 to 7 tonight. There's a graduation open house for Bethany Weaver this Saturday from 1 to 4 here at the church. Everyone is in, invited for that. Bethany just graduated from high school, and we're celebrating that milestone in her life. Uh, Free for Life is going to a, a park in Fort Wayne next Sunday to serve a meal to the homeless and have a worship service with them. Um, they'll be leaving from the church at 4 o'clock. If you'd like to go with them, there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board in the foyer for those that would like to go with them. If you aren't necessarily inclined to go with them to the um, service but would like to provide food, um, please sign up for that as well and bring that and have it here in the morning so that they know how much they have before they actually get ready to go for that uh, ministry service next Sunday for Free for Life. And then three years ago, uh, Victor and Cassidy Beaker were married, and for their bridal shower, they asked that we def defer any gifts until they had a place to land on their own because they were kind of in transition, didn't want a lot of things to, to keep moving along the way. So now's the time that they're on their own and going to have a house in Sault Ste. Marie where uh, Victor will be pursuing his master's in library science and also working at a library there in Sault Ste. Marie. So if you would like to help them out with a three-year delayed uh, shower, <laughs> um, we're just doing uh, gift cards, those kind of things, and there's a lot of information in your service folder in the bulletin that you can uh, resource there in order to know how to best do that for them. One other announcement that came um, to our attention this morning, Dave Gly passed, passed away uh, late last night. Um, he's been struggling with Parkinson's for a long time, Parkinson's disease for a long time. Edie was able to get in in the last uh, 36 hours or so to see Dave, which was absolutely wonderful because her availability to Dave has been severely restricted since uh, the middle of March because of this whole COVID thing. And so um, Pastor Dave was able to get in and, and pray and be with uh, Dave as well. And so um, at least uh, Dave had a chance to get together with some family members before he did pass away. The uh, arrangements are pending. Um, I'm not sure if they're meeting, the family is meeting with the funeral home either today or tomorrow. But as soon as we know that information, if we have your contact information, um, we'll send that out to you. If we don't have your contact information, that's what the welcome sheet is for. Um, give us your contact information, and we'll either phone tree you, um, receive, you'll receive a phone call for, from us giving the funeral information, or else we'll email you and let you know that. Um, at this time, Eric Saunders is going to have our call to worship from Psalm 100. Please stand as we'll be reading and reciting God's word. Good morning. Today's call to worship is from Psalms 100. I'll read the leader text. If you could all respond by reading the alt text. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come to the Lord in a joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is, it is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his court with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. 
For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's pray and invite the Lord into this service this morning. Father, we thank you so much that you are good. Your faithfulness endures through all generations. God, you are faithful to us in ways we cannot even see sometimes. Lord, help us to see. Help us to hear. God, and as a result of this service, we just ask that you would give us, you would, you would even more fully equip us to be able to discern, hear, hear and discern your voice, Lord, and to follow it. Not, to, not just to be mere hearers or readers of the word, but to be doers. As we follow you, our great shepherd, God, thank you so much for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles and open them up if you would. We're in the Psalms again. We're staying in the Psalms. Yesterday I was with uh, Dave, Dave Gly. We were reading Psalm 23, right? a psalm that we hear a lot at um, uh, eternal graduation ceremonies um, and one that we most dearly love. There's a lot of shepherd and sheep imagery in today's, in what we're looking at today that I felt it appropriate to do another psalm or to use a psalm as, as auxiliary text. So we're going to be reading um, auxiliary. For our auxiliary text, Psalm 23. So, uh, Jenny, please give me your horse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me in all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is God's word. You may be seated. So... Shepherd and sheep, uh, imagery that is very much prevalent in our, um, in our text today. We don't live in an agrarian society, um, but I think it's important for us, if we want to really understand what's going on in the text we're looking at today, to kind of get a picture of what it's, what it's like to be a sheep, what it's like to be a shepherd, maybe, what it's like to be a flock, what the fold is all about. Um, and what we're going to see later in this text that's really going to become apparent, I think, or something that really jumped out to me in this text that we're going to be studying is the fact that the sheep, the real sheep, can hear, they discern, but they follow their shepherd's voice. There's a distinct voice that Jesus has. Now, it's not like necessarily like how you're hearing me talk, but at the same time, it is distinct from all the other voices that can call out to the sheep. And I've got a just a really cool illustration of this on the next slide, so a little video clip. Let's go ahead and watch. Isn't that cool? It's just so, I just, I thought that was fascinating when I'm just thinking about this whole, this whole shepherd sheep analogy and 
um, it just made me think, you know, in, in studying this text and looking at the text we're looking at today, Jesus says he's the good shepherd and that those that belong to him discern and follow his voice. They have an ability to, to filter out all these other voices. And that's just kind of a fun video to illustrate that. But at the same time, like, I think that, that forces us to ask ourselves, whose voice are we hearing? There are a lot of voices in our lives today. Um, unless you live in a cave or something, which there aren't, uh, there's only one cave in Hillsdale County that I know of and you really can't live in it. There's a lot of voices speaking and trying to vie for attention in our lives. And so we have to ask ourselves, I think, whose voice are we hearing? Whose voice are you following? And that's really the crux of the passage, I think, that we're going we're gonna to hear today. But at this time, um, we're going to transition to a time where we worship in song. Our worship team can come on up and get ready. Um, we're going to worship in song. We do this actually a couple of different ways right now. We, we worship in song, but we also worship in giving. And so if you're here, we're going to stand and worship if you're joining us in the gym on the, on the video, or maybe you're on in your Facebook <laughs> a live feed, live stream feed, um, you can give at hillsdalefmc.net slash give. You can also worship with us in song wherever you're at. If you're at home, maybe you're in your pajamas, I don't know. If you're here, you can also give by get, putting your uh, tithes and offerings in the baskets in front of you. But can we stand and lift up, as one flock, can we like lift up our voices this morning and celebrate and worship Jesus? Let's do that. As Dave says, he is our shepherd, and he leads us on the one true way. So let's sing. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress. You are my portion, you are my hiding place, I believe you are the way, the truth. Sing that one more time. 
the way, the truth, the life, I believe you are. He is the way, the truth. Uh, now, if I can uh, ch just change directions a little bit on you here. Um, have you ever met somebody that maybe they're just a little more, they, they live like they're entitled, like, give me an example, maybe like a boss, or uh, the owner's son <laughs> of a company who, uh, you know, they, they're there, but they might not be qualified for the job, but they have this attitude of belonging, even though, you know what I'm thinking, in my day and age, when I was growing up, we called those pastor's kids, <laughs> so, yes, I'm picking on a few of you out there right now, but, um, no, <laughs> If you really think about that, though, that's kind of how we are when we come before God. If it's on our own merit, we fall entirely short. We don't make it one bit, yet we can come boldly and confidently into his presence. We can come boldly and confidently into life because, he, because of the work of someone else, because of what Jesus has done for us. And we need to rest on that and lean on him. So let's sing this song, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, arms to him today. We are leaning on him today, and maybe you're here, and, you know, this week has been rough, to put it that way. Um, we just invite you, no matter where you are, if you would like a special prayer this week, we just invite you right now. We'd love to have you come out to the altar, but we're trying to be honoring of that social distance. But just know our hearts are with you. So if you would like special prayer today, just ask that you can be seated right where you're at. And if you see someone seated, guys, let's lift them up before the Lord as we continue to sing.
shaping my Spirit strong in me, my flesh may fail, my God, you never will. So Lord, we come before you. Lord, we confess that we are broken inside, that Lord, left to our own, we are nothing. Lord, we fall short time and time again of our thoughts stray each and every day, Lord. But Lord, by your mercy as the good shepherd, you draw us back to you. You call us, Lord. And God, your people know your voice. And God, time and time again, we thank you again for your mercy that washes away our sins, that washes away our failures, that Lord, in the, in the midst of the pain, you offer comfort. You offer hope. Lord, something that this life cannot offer, you freely can, Lord. Lord, for some reason, you choose to love us, despite our constant love of you. And so, Lord, we ask that you would take our hearts, take our minds, take our souls today, and surrender them to you. In Jesus' name we pray.
beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful time of worship and song. You know, I when you think of the holiness of God, there is this an illustration um, I've heard once. It's really been helpful to me. Um, and that's this that, you know, if you if you're to think of the holiness of God and then ask yourself, is What is what is more close to God's holiness? Um, the angels that encircle the throne singing 
holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come, like we read in Revelation, or the pond scum that floats on the surface of the Arboretum's pond? And the answer is neither. Because God is so much more holy, much more infinitely holy than we can ever possibly imagine. We will spend a million years in heaven and we will not scratch the surface of understanding how wonderfully holy our Lord is. So thank you so much for that wonderful time of singing, reflecting on that. If you have your Bibles, open them up if you would, me, if you would with me, please. I can't, I, I can't English today. Uh, to John chapter 10, we're continuing our, our look in this amazing gospel of Jesus in his life and ministry when he was with us. Um, things are obviously kind of ramping up. We've been seeing this, this text that we're about to read comes on the heels of, you know, Jesus healing that blind man, right? Um, and so we're going to hear about that in, or we heard about that a couple weeks ago and just kind of are going to re- reflect further on who Jesus is and what he came to do. In this text, he butts heads with the Pharisees. Surprise! <laughs> Jesus had this like awesome way of like riling, riling up feathers. Again, I can't English this morning. Forgive me. Um, but he got him pretty ticked with some of the things he said, right? The whole I am statements, especially that boy, that bombshell, I am that I am. Man, he really riled him up with that one. We're going to look at that uh, today in a little bit in uh, John chapter 10. But before we do, you know, one time Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson went on a camping trip. Anybody familiar with Sherlock Holmes? Okay, yeah, yeah. So... Sherlock and, and uh, Dr. Watson went on a camping trip, and sometime in the middle of the night, uh, Sherlock Holmes was startled. He woke up, and he nudged, his, he nudged Watson, you know, and he says, Watson, look up and tell me what you see. And Watson replied, I see millions of stars. And Holmes says to Watson, well, what does that tell you, Holmes? Or what does that tell you? Watson pondered for a minute. He said, well, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of stars. Astrologically, it tells me that Saturn is in Leo this time of year. Orologically, I can approximate that the time is about 3.15 in the morning. Theologically, I can tell that God is incredibly large and infinitely big, and I'm incredibly small and infinitesimal. Meteorologically, I can deduce that we'll probably have a good day tomorrow. Why? What does it tell you, Holmes? Watson, you idiot, someone stole our tent. We live in an age and time where there are so many voices talking to us that it's easy to miss, it's easy to get lost in what is real, what our real circumstance is, because we focus so much on all these other areas, and we allow all these other voices to speak into our lives and influence them, and what we're about to see in this passage we're looking at Jesus makes this case that, guess what, those that who are truly his sheep, guess what, they listen to his voice. Not only that, they listen to his voice, and they follow it. They don't listen to other voices. In fact, their radar should tell them to avoid them altogether. Anybody ever been in a sheep pen? Oh, man, we don't, we don't live in a, in a uh, uh, agrarian society, but I, you know, whenever I've run into a sheep pen, the sheep kind of tend to run from me. I don't know if you've ever tried that. Um, sheep are good at a couple things. Eating is one of them. Uh, running from strangers is another. And so the passage we're going to read here today is going to tell us. It's the fact that Jesus is not, he's, he's talking to these Pharisees and he gets to the point that he's like, hey, look, you know what? I don't expect you to understand. I don't expect you to listen to what I'm saying. You're not my sheep. You belong to somebody else. And so we're going to look at this text today. These Pharisees had become willfully blind. Like, all the evidence was pointing to the fact that Jesus was who he said he was. He was this promised Messiah that they themselves could look back in their own prophecies and put two and two together to say, yeah, this is the guy that was supposed to come and redeem Israel. But they were willfully blind and deaf to the reality of who he was time and time and time again. And things escalate because of this. So they were, quite frankly, hell-bent on pursuing their own agenda instead of God's. These guys were entrusted to be shepherds of Israel, and they had failed miserably in that regard, and we're continuing to fail. So at this time, I think Fred Saunders is going to 
oh, I'm sorry, Lacey Saunders is going to come forward and lead us in the reading of this text. Would you stand out of respect for the reading of God's word? Hey, college students, we're, we're so thankful that you're back. Um, and guests, yeah, uh, it's been great. Um, we just want to let you know, like, one of the things we do, we stand a lot of times when we read God's word because kind of like you stand when we say the Pledge of Allegiance, right, out of respect. Um, I'm getting ready to comment on this and flap my gums and stuff, but what's really important that you hear today is this, right, that we stand out of respect. Lace, Lace, please say, read this text for us. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 20. Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and it scatters it. Then the man runs away from the man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep knows me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my, of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon possessed and a raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? This is God's word. You may be seated. Yeah, hopefully when you came in, you received a uh, bulletin or you grabbed a bulletin. If you didn't, you know, you can catch up with these notes online. For those of you that are at maybe um, you're worshiping at home on your smart TV or on Facebook or whatever, um, you know, you can go to hillsdellefmc.net and then connect, uh, kind of catch up with the notes there. Um, but again, if you, if you pull this out, there's a lot of things that I want to just share that are, I, I think were helpful for me in studying this text. And then there is a ton more on our website under the message, under this message that it's going to, there's a lot of nuances to this text. I just can't cover it all, right? But I pray and I sit there with the text and be like, Lord, what, what do we need to share today? And so I'm going to try to focus on that. But if you want to learn more, um, feel free to get the, the further notes online. Things are amping up with these um, shepherds of Israel. And it's no surprise because Jesus, it, the, the reality of who Jesus is rubs pretty hard against um, who these guys are, and right, what they're all about. And so I think the question that we need to ask or the question I'd like to explore with you today is this, that what, what is Jesus trying to get through the thick heads of these Pharisees, right? Like these guys are there, they're just time and time and time again, they are turning away from all truth, it seems, but what is Jesus trying to get through their thick heads, right? Because it might be needing to get into our heads this morning. And I think the answer is this, that he alone, Jesus alone is the hope of mankind. As both the gate and the good shepherd, Jesus is the sole source. That's it, sole source of eternal salvation, protection, provision, and fullness of life. One of my favorite verses is John 10, 10, where Jesus says, I came so that they may have life and have it to the full. It wasn't, Jesus came to save us, yeah, from ourselves, <laughs> from our sin and our destruction, but he also came to save us so that we can have a fullness of life that cannot be experienced apart from Christ. And I think it's important that we remember that, but that only happens when we follow him. And so that's the word of the day. The word of the day is, is follow. 
So what are these figures of speech, right? Jesus says these are figures of speech. These Pharisees can't understand. Um, in verse 6, what are they trying to tell us? What, what do they reveal about Jesus as the gate and the good shepherd? First of all, I think that it reveals, or just reinforces rather, that Jesus saves. Redeeming people from ruin. Jesus came as the good shepherd to, sh to save those who would become his flock from utter eternal ruin. Without Christ, like we are on that path. We're headed off a cliff, folks, if we're, if we're without Christ, because one day, this life, we are checking out. As Pastor Keith has said sometimes, I love it when he says, you know, there, nobody's getting out of this alive. And Jesus did come to save us from eternal ruin, you know, ruin brought, brought on by our disobedience. You know, these Pharisees, while they were supposedly the shepherd of, shepherds of Israel, they were supposed to be guarding and protecting their flock, they were neglecting their duty. Why? Because they were just the hirelings. They, they, had, they had been lost for some time. And in all honesty, texts like this really haunt me because they remind me of texts like Ezekiel 34, where God really comes down on shepherds who neglect their flock. You know, they didn't care for the sheep. These guys didn't care for the sheep. They cared about holding on to their power, their tradition, their authority. Their status. But Jesus came to save those who would become his flock. Anybody ever here ever work with sheep? Okay, sheep aren't noticed. Okay, yeah, sheep are not known for being the smartest creatures, right? I don't know if you've ever thought about this. R. Kent Hughes in his comments on uh, Psalm 23, which we read earlier. It's a great psalm, by the way. I was able, I, it was great. I was able to read that with Dave uh, Gly yesterday. He just... Uh, you know, as, I, as he was transitioning, and it just reminds me how wonderful a God we have, the good shepherd. But R. Ken Hughes has a, some amazing insights on sheep in light of what we read in Psalm 23. He says this, he says, sheep are not theoretically helpless. They are absolutely helpless. <laughs> on a hot day, sheep will die in just a couple of hours. In cool weather, it may linger for a few days. But the point is, there is nothing the sheep can do for itself. Nothing. It is absolutely helpless. Even without enemies, sheep need to have a shepherd attentively watching over them 24 hours a day. Isn't that crazy? You know, sheep are prone to wander. And think about this. This is what's fascinating. Wonderfully ironic, right? That the Bible time and time again calls us sheep. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own away. But the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all so that when we are in him, we are safe from ruin praise be to god luke 19 10 for the son of man came to seek and save the lost and so i think that's why the second thing i think we should need to, need to recognize in this is that jesus protects securing his flock from threat i don't know if you saw that in the text he's talking to these pharisees and these pharisees are the ones who who he speaks of in verse 8, the ones that had came before him were thieves and robbers. But he says the sheep did not listen to them. And he, and he goes on in verse 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come out and go in and find pasture. Jesus protects. He secures his flock from threat. But I think it's easy to miss the, the, the kind of the bigger picture of this, right? If we don't understand, if we don't try to better understand what Jesus is trying to illustrate here. In the Middle East, and actually, um, we saw some of these in Kenya when I was in Kenya. Um, it's not uncommon to have these things called sheepfolds, which were kind of these stony-walled structures. Sometimes they were square. We saw them when we were in Kenya. They were uh, circular. And they were kind of a communal, like, resting place for people in the community. Back then, they didn't like, like, people actually did community together. Like, they depended on each other quite a bit. And, and they were just kind of open for shepherds to bring their flocks into this thing. So imagine this big walled structure, and there is an opening whereby the shepherd can bring the flock in at night. And the, the structure could be big enough to hold a couple of flocks. But what would happen regardless is when the shepherd would bring his flock in at night, that opening, he would literally lay in that opening so that if anything wanted to get into the pen... They couldn't, they had to go through the shepherd 
Likewise, if the sheep wanted to get out, right, the shepherd wasn't just going to let them out whenever they wanted to. Like, he was going to keep them safe. Think about this for a moment. This is an incredible picture of Jesus. I love this sort of picture of Jesus here because it tells me that anything, anything that is outside of that sheep pen, right, if they have ill intentions on getting to the sheep and destroying the sheep, they got to go through Jesus who's sitting blocking the gate, blocking the entrance. Last year, um, my uh, vice president Pence drove by my house, <laughs> Actually, because he came down this street here in his old motorcade to go uh, do his uh, uh, graduation speech, right, at the college last year. And, uh, you know, I'm just thinking, if I, if I were to just, w- like, walk over to the Beerman Center, right, like, I could, I could throw a stone and probably hit it, maybe, um, definitely a golf ball. But if I were to just go over there and try to get in the door, I guarantee you there is going to be someone standing at that door that I'm going to have to get through if I'm going to get in, if I'm not supposed to be there, Right? And if I try, right, I, it's going to be a bad day. Can I just say that? <laughs> Think of this. Jesus is standing in the gate, and he protects his sheep. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Folks, that means in Jesus there is nothing that can ultimately harm or hurt those that are in his flock. Are you going to have a, a bad days? Yeah. Are you going to experience sorrow in this life? Heck yeah, you're going to experience sorrow in this life. But in the final analysis, when everything is said and done, this life is only a blip on the radar. And in the scope of eternity, when we are in Christ, we will ultimately be protected and kept safe from threat. Three, Jesus provides, offering people fullness of life. Again, my, one of my favorite verses, Jesus says, I didn't come that they could just live. Everybody does that. No, I came so that they could have life to the full. And folks, there is a fullness of life that can only be experienced in relationship to Jesus. There's only, there's a certain surf, there's a certain sense, there's a certain reality that evolves safety when you're in proximity to the shepherd, when you're in the flock. And Jesus provides, offering people fullness of life. So Jesus not only protects standing at that gate, protecting his sheep, but you know what he also does? He doesn't just keep his sheep in the sheep pen. No, he leads them to good pastures, right? We read that in Proverbs, or in Psalms 23, he didn't just keep them in a pen. No, he takes them to the safe places, the places to get good food, the places to grow, the places that are going to bring fullness of life, protect and provide for the, his sheep. What an amazing picture that we have this good shepherd in life. Finally, and fourthly, and I think this is a big one for us today, the one I'm kind of hitting on a little bit more, and that's this, that Jesus proves by distinguishing his flock by those who listen and follow. These Pharisees heard all the things Jesus was saying, but they followed none of them. And Jesus ultimately says to them, did you see this in the text? Just as the Father knows me, and I am the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen, I must bring them also. They too. Guys, that's us, by the way. We are those other sheep. They too will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. And he basically tells these Pharisees, look, I don't expect you to get it. Why? Because you're not a part of my flock. You can't understand what I'm saying. You know, the, the things that are spiritual are only discerned by spiritual eyes and ears. And the ability to hear Jesus, to listen, to follow, is, is very much distinguished by how we listen, whether we're able to distinguish the voice of Jesus and whether or not we do something with that and follow him. The Bible says, don't be merely (laughs) readers of the word, but be doers, right? There's an element of listening and following and being a part of the flock. Mm. You know, I think one of the interesting things too is is that, you know, going back to the whole idea of the, the agrarian society is that those sheep pens, Right? Like I mentioned earlier, th- people used to live in communities that were very much dependent, interdependent on one another. And so it wasn't uncommon for multiple herds. You might have a couple herds in one of these sheep pens, these sheep enclosures, right? 
So in the morning, what would happen? Well, the shepherds would wake up or whatever, and they would get up, and they would call their sheep out. They didn't have to physically separate their flocks. No, as we saw earlier, did you see how that shepherd had that distinct calling, and all the sheep started running to it, right? Eventually, it came to the shepherd. It didn't listen to the other voice. I think what Jesus is saying here is, you know, those who truly belong to him, they don't have to be sorted out. You're going to tell because they're going to listen. They're going to discern his voice. They're going to not only hear it, but they're going to follow it. These Pharisees were incapable of understanding the fullness of what Jesus was saying because, quite frankly, they weren't a part of his flock. And as we read a couple chapters ago in chapter 8, their father was, in fact, the devil. Chapter 8, verse 44. J. Vernon McGee on this, uh, on this text comments that wherever we find people who are eager for the word of God, we know they are his sheep. And that's one of the reasons why your pastors here at this church, our, our church, one of the um, values that we hold so, so incredibly de- dear. And we, we let this, this permeates all kinds of ways that, that we approach church is that we, we start here. Because this is God's voice to us. So we have to start there. So let's bring this home a bit and just kind of dissect it from more of a practical sense. So in conclusion, how should these figures of speech challenge our present reality? I want you to think about some things here. So in conclusion, right? The first one, am I pursuing God by his means or my own? We got to ask ourselves that. Well, how do we find out? Well, well, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the good news is that God hasn't left us on our own to figure this out. God has given us his word. He's given you pastors. He's given you church. He's given you the fellowship of other believers, people that are much more wiser <laughs> and holier than me. <laughs> there, are, there are people in this congregation whose faith puts me to shame. And I hope someday that my faith can be like theirs. Although they've got, they've got a few years on me yet. Um, the point is this, is that when you are in close proximity to the shepherd and the rest of the flock, there's an innate benefit. There's an inherent benefit to doing that, to being a part of the flock, right? To pursuing God by his means, which we find out from reading his word. We study this, we read it, we take it to heart, we, we listen to it, but then we become doers of it. We don't just merely read the word and then or like it says in the man who looks in the mirror and turns away and forgets what he looks like. We don't want to do that. No, we want to read the word and do it. And in doing so, we learn how to pursue God by his means and not ours. Rodney Whitaker, I think, just did a uh, he commenting on this text. And this quote is in your sermon outline, I think, your sermon notes. He says this. He says, the salvation Jesus brings is personal, but it's not merely individual. He knows each sheep by name. Those of you in here that are a part of the flock, he knows you by name. But salvation is membership in a community. The community that is called and guided and provided for by Christ. The flock of Christ is neither, get this, an aggregate of isolated, autonomous individuals, nor a faceless corporation, but a community in which each member is taken up into the life of God to form with others a single whole as branches of a vine. Folks, you are not meant to do life in isolation. None of us were designed that way. We were meant to be a part of a flock together. And as, even as we each hear and discern God's voice in our lives, like he calls all of his sheep to be a part of a flock. Dr. Andrew Bonar um, was telling D.L. Moody once, talking to D.L. Moody once, how in the highlands of Scotland, sheep are known to wander off into some pretty dangerous places. They're not really known for being the smartest of creatures, and he would, they would sometimes wander off into these kind of rocky areas of Scotland, up these cliffs, and, and at the, there, were, there, were, there was like a particular sweetness, I guess, to the grass that was in these areas, and so these sheep would be known to jump like up to 10 or 12 feet down to an area where the sweet grass was. They would jump down there and begin eating, you know, and doing their thing, and then finally the, the grass would run out, and they would like realize, uh... Oh, shoot. (laughs) There's a long way up there. I can't get up there, and they're out of food. So what do they do? What do sheep do? They start bleeding. Not like um, 
not like bleeding, like, uh, like, baaing, right? Okay, was that, <laughs> was that good? <laughs> okay, bah. Who can make a good sheep noise? Oh, you sound like a great flock of sheep. Look at that. Okay, good job, guys. <clears throat> they would start bleeding because they're like, give me, save me, res- you know, rescue me. And uh, Deal was like, well, what do you do then? He says, well, he says the shepherd would wait until the sheep were so, were so tired and faint. Like they jumped, they got themselves into this predicament, right? And the shepherds would wait until they were so tired and faint they could barely stand. And it was only then that the shepherd would tie a rope around them to pull them back up and rescue them. And Deal asked this, this is fascinating. He says, why don't they just go down there when the sheep first get down there? Right, like if, they're, if they just jump down there, why doesn't the shepherd just jump down and rescue them then? And to which he replied, he said, if we would do that, they would run right off the cliff. And so this is how people are sometimes. We want to pursue God our own way instead of the ways that he's taught us to, he's told us to. And we're like those sheep, right? When we want to pursue God on our own, we kind of find ourselves in some pretty crazy predicaments in life or or with with burdens that we weren't meant to carry because we wandered away from the flock. We wandered away from our shepherd. The voice has become distant in our lives. We're not listening to Jesus. We're not able to hear. Jeremiah 17, 5 says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. There's a reality that we need to be pursuing God by his means in order to be saved, in order to be protected, in order to be in that fold. Um, And B is this, the second thing, the second question. Am I trusting the good shepherd? Or someone else. We've become known as being a people far more interested in feeling than thinking. And this is hard. Because the problem with this is then when we, when we, when we just pursue what kind of tickles our feelings, we inadvertently absorb things into our worldview that will destroy us. We have to learn to trust, to listen to, and to trust the good shepherd. Not every voice that comes across our Facebook feed, our Twitter feed, our newsreel. Not everything that's shared with us on social media. We have to build a sort of framework by which we can filter these things out. You know, and so the the third question, you know, is am I trusting God? But am I, whose voice am I hearing? We have to be able to discern. How do you discern Jesus' voice? Well, when you hear a, when you hear a voice or when you, when you hear something come across, and I think when I say voice, sometimes like there's like false teachers out there. Like there's still a thing <laughs> called false teachers, and there's still a thing called false doctrine that will really ruin you if you follow it. Well, how do we know whose voice we're hearing? We study this, the voice we've already been given. There's a lot of people that are just like, oh, I just want to hear a word from the Lord. Well, let me give you one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. (laughs) That's right. So who are we listening to? Who are we hearing? We have to be careful. Jesus' voice is very distinct. I remember when I I was a kid, um, in in, in this area, some people like to raise free-range chickens, right? Like, I was a free-range kid. Um, I, I grew up in an age where I could just hop on a bike and ride all over town and nobody cared and they weren't worried about me being trafficked or anything like that. And these days it's like, whoa, we can't do that. But I was kind of one of them free range kids that I would hop on my bike. I'd ride all over town. All right. But it, it, it always was weird because like my dad, when I was a kid, developed this very distinct whistle that I swear I could hear across town. Now I can't, I can whistle like tunes and stuff, but I can't whistle to the decibel level that my dad could. To this day, I can hear his whistle in my head. And the, the tune is, it goes, <whistles> that was dad's whistle, right? Except for it would be like at 160 decibels, okay? It didn't matter where I was in the neighborhood, I could hear that whistle. And when I did, one of two things was true. It was either time for dinner or I was in deep trouble, <laughs> But either way, I knew it was time to get my butt home. 
There's a distinctness to Jesus' voice. Like we, can, we should be able to hear it. As Christians, we should learn how to hear it. And we learn how to hear and distinguish it by reading what he's already written, by studying that, by being a part of a flock, you know, by allowing pastors to speak into your life, by allowing mature Christians to speak into one another's lives. Are feelings good? Yes! But unless we have a framework by which those feelings are filtered, you're susceptible to believing all kinds of things. And when you believe in everything, ultimately, you're really just believing nothing. So whose voice am I hearing? we got to ask ourselves that question, guys. Yeah, when you pop out your phone after this and you see your Facebook feed today, just ask yourself, whose voice am I hearing? And then finally, whose voice am I following? Right? Can I discern the voices that I'm hearing? And then out of those voices, which one do I need to follow? That's, that's where it gets really, really important today, folks, because Jesus made it clear that his sheep not only listen, but they follow. They follow. You know, we don't want to be just merely hearers of the word, but we want to be doers of the word as well. And so my worship point is this. We worship what we love most. And if Jesus takes center stage in our hearts as good shepherds, as, as our good shepherd, worship happens. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Why? Because he is the author and perfecter of your faith. He, if he has begun a good work in you, he will be faithful to complete it. But it's a partnership that you enter into whereby you hear his voice and you respond to it. My gospel application is this, is as the one good shepherd, Jesus laid down his life. We read that in the text. He laid down his life. Why? To take it up again. He didn't lay down his life fixated on the cross as if that's the end game. The end game wasn't the cross. The end game was eventually the resurrection and the glory that his sheep would all get to partake in. But as the one good shepherd, Jesus laid down his life to provide real life for those who would belong to him by faith, to those who would be a part of his flock, who would respond to him in faith. Jesus is holding out this offer of real life to those who would respond to him in faith. He's saying, you know what, I don't want to just save you. I want you to have the best life possible. And by best life possible, I don't mean like Learjet, you know, Beamer, Yacht, all that stuff. What I'm talking about is a life that's actually worth living, that's meaningful, that's purposeful, that has eternity in mind. Because guess what, folks? You are a soul. You just happen to have a body. And one day that soul is going to live on. In Christ, it'll live on forever. And everything that you experience in this life will be a blip on the radar. So real life fullness of life is in Jesus alone. And he didn't design us to be his flock in isolation. He wants us to be in community with other people. That's so important for our culture to get because our culture is, is, is relentlessly autonomous, it seems. We want to be our own person, be our own thing, we do our own thing. But Christ's way is not that. It's communal. There's a picture of a sheep. This is a the sheep's name, Shrek. Anybody ever seen this guy before? No? Okay, Shrek, Shrek was a famous sheep. I think he was from New Zealand. This is Shrek the sheep. Shrek the, sh- Shrek the, sh- Shrek the sheep by the seashore. <laughs> I get English. Okay. This is Shrek the sheep. And Shrek became famous several years ago, and he somehow wandered away from his shepherd. You know, and he was able to live and hide in these caves around the area where he was at. And believe it or not, he eluded capture in these, by hiding out in these various caves and stuff for six years. Can you believe it? I mean, he looks like a big pile of nasty mashed potatoes. <laughs> six years. When they finally caught up to him and finally caught him, he was carrying six times the weight in wool. And he, the, they sheared him. Here's, the, here's what he looked like after he sheared. This big, huge, like, cloud, puffball, ugly mashed potato dude becomes like this super tall sheep. Six years of accumulating fleece. When they finally sheared it, the the fleece weighed 60 pounds. Enough to make, get this, enough to make 20 men's suits. That's a lot of wool. All that time, all those years, Shrek was carrying six times the weight on his shoulders 
that he was designed to carry. And that's what happens to us when we wander away from the flock. When we wander away from the shepherd. When we listen, when we allow voices to influence us that are leading us away from Jesus. And we're no longer listening to Jesus, but we're listening to all these other things. And we kind of wander away. That's what happens. We carry all kinds of burdens we weren't meant to carry. You know, it, reasons this, it stands to reason that there's an innate benefit. There's an inerrant benefit of being in proximity to both the flock and the shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. He cares for the sheep. He loves them. He wants to give them protection and provision. He wants them in the fold. Why? Because he loves you and he cares for you. And so just, just kind of a closing thought. Um, you know, we're going to have the worship team, I think, is going to come up and lead us in another song here. Um, and they can go ahead and come on up and just get ready. But um, you got to ask yourself, I want to ask, are you in a position to surrender the, to the shepherd? You know, have you, have you listened? Have you learned to discern Jesus' voice? Are you surrendering to that voice? Have you surrendered to that voice? If you've never done that, I would love to talk with you after the service and tell you about what Jesus has done in my life, how he's become my shepherd. Um, and if you have, I would just encourage you, keep listening to that voice. Keep following that voice. That's the voice that matters. That's the voice you should be following and allowing to guide each of step of your life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for who you are and just ask that you would be with us. Lord, help us to hear and distinguish your voice. There's so many voices right now. <laughs> Lord, it's an election year. You, <laughs> you know how crazy it is. We've just got so much stuff coming at us. Do this, do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. How dare you do this? How dare you do that? God, help us amidst all the voices to be able to distinguish yours. Lord, we want to be good sheep. You know, and I know, I know I mess up. I know we mess up. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Help us to not only be hearers of the word, but doers. Help us not only to hear your voice, but to listen, follow, and surrender to it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and sing. Oh, to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him
encourage you to receive this benediction. This is from Hebrews 13. That's where it writes, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today, folks. We'll see you next week. Have a great week.